Welcome back to beyoungministry.blogspot.com to another blog and another podcast. Today we're in Luke chapter 9 verses 37 through 43 which reads, The next day when they came down from the mountain a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. That's Luke chapter 9, verses 37 through 43. After the Lord Jesus and his three guys came down from the mountain, there was a large gathering of people waiting for the Lord Jesus. A man in the crowd begged him to look at his demon-possessed son, for he had begged his disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Most people would have have us focus on the demon, but that would, that would be to miss the point. The Lord Jesus says in verse 41, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. The focus should not be on the demon. The focus should be on our faith in the God of the Bible. This sad story is about the importance of believing that God has said and God has the power that flows from the promises that he has given. The emphasis should be that. Believing in God and believing in his power that flow from his promises. This story takes place on the heels of the mountaintop transfiguration of the Lord Jesus. It provides a contrast between being defined by the light or being defined by the darkness. It takes place in the contrast of their mountaintop experience and this man's valley experience. On the mountain, the Lord Jesus was front and center, whereas in the valley, Satan is getting a lot of attention. Two sons, one is fulfilling a plan from God, devised from the from before time began. The other is trapped in the wicked web of the one who is trying to thwart the purposes of God. One is controlled by a demon, the other controls the demon. The demon-possessed son is delivered and given back to his father. The son of God is killed and raised from the dead and has ascended back to the father. This father of the demon-possessed boy believes the Lord Jesus has the power to deliver his son. He falls down in a reverent posture and humility before the only one who can do what needed to be done. It is as if he had gone up the mountain and had seen the transfiguration. In verse 38, the father begged the Lord Jesus to look at my son. He wanted him to look at his boy with great and deep concern. This word for look is an intense word. Anytime we have a preposition in front of a verb, the verb is intensified. And he is saying, could you please, out of all of this crowd of needy people, pay special attention to my one and only son? Now here is a boy that is so dominated by a demon, he can't hear and he can't speak. And the demon is doing everything he can to throw him into a fire. And the father has tried to protect his son over and over from this deadly power. In verse 39, the father says, a spirit seizes him. 
He knew it wasn't psychological or physiological. He knew it was demonic. He knew his son was possessed with a spirit that made him mute. And so the father pleads for the intervention of God himself. Previous to this story, when the Lord Jesus sent the disciples out to do ministry, he gave them the ability to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. But as indicated in verse 40, the disciples could not free this boy from his, this demon. According to Matthew 17, 19, and 20, the disciples couldn't free the boy due to the smallness of their faith. There was no lack of available power. There was no lack of experience. There was no lack of knowing whatever a formula they might have needed. There was no lack of commission. There was a lack of faith. And so in verse 42, the Lord Jesus said, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. They did not fail because they did not expect anything to happen, because they did. We almost always think of faith as some kind of expectation that something is going to happen. If we can just believe something is going to happen, it will happen. But these disciples did believe something was going to happen. They were surprised when it did not happen. They expected the boy to be delivered. They had seen people delivered before from demons when they said the word and did so in Jesus' name. But this time it did not happen. So faith is not merely a sense of expecting something to happen. The Lord Jesus said their problem was that they were faithless. Yet, they did have a kind of faith. They expected that something would happen. They had faith, but it had changed from faith in the God of the Bible to faith in the process they were following. They thought if if you said the right words and followed the right ritual, that the demon would have, have to leave. Without their even realizing it, they had transferred their faith from confidence in God, who can act, to a formula that can bring it about. In Mark's gospel, we are told what the boy's father said. He said, I do believe, help my unbelief. Out of the honesty of his weakness, he cast himself before the Lord. That kind of faith is small, but it's like a grain of mustard seed. It is able to move mountains. The moment he said those words, the moment he cast himself and his weakness back on the Lord, that was all God wanted. Our Lord spoke the words and his son was delivered. In verses 42 and 43, we read, Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Peter, John, and James saw the greatness and power of God on the mountaintop. Now, the other nine, as well as the crowd, see his greatness and power down in the valley. In order for our faith to grow in him, we need the contrast. We need, we need, we like comfort, yet it is when we are most uncomfortable that we depend upon him the most and subsequently grow in our faith best. We need constant reminders of his greatness and power to keep our faith going. The reality is we live in the valley and we will never see for ourselves his greatness and power until we are more and more dependent upon him. That's the key in this passage, dependency upon God. Out of our helplessness, we cry out like the Father. Of course, this is the role of those unwanted trials that come into our lives. Thank him for those trials, because it is through the trials that we are able to see him more clearly, and we are enabled 
to be more dependent upon Him. My friends, I trust this podcast and this blog are helping you in your walk with the Lord. If I can be of further assistance to you, shoot me an email at beyoungministry at gmail.com. Hey, have a great day.